Welcome and thank you very much indeed for joining this Meritas Capability webinar on the impact of Brexit on employers and their workforce. I'm delighted today that today we have an international audience highlighting the Brexit and its implications is very much an issue of global interest. Quick introduction, my name is Quentin Vale. I'm the European Director of Meritas. Meritas is a premier global network of over 190 independent law firms in 90 countries around the world. We were founded about 30 years ago and our member firms work closely together to serve the local cross-border and international legal needs of clients across all areas of commercial and business law. Before I introduce our expert panel today, just a few housekeeping issues. Meritas offers the ability to listen to our webinars through your computer speakers. If, however, at any time you have difficulty in hearing the presentation, you may dial in instead using the numbers here. However, as all the phone lines will be muted, if you experience any te technical difficulties, please press star zero at any time to connect to your with a support technician. During today's session, we will be running a couple of polls so please do look out for those and provide your views on the issues raised. We will have time for questions at the end. So if you do have a question for our panel, please do just pop it into the question box and we will do our best to answer those at the end. And finally, um, we will distribute a recording of this webinar in the next couple of days. Um, and this and all our other capability webinars can be found on the Meritas website on www.meritas.org. Okay, with that, I would just now, now like to introduce our panelists for today's webinar. Firstly, Neil Richmond. He is a member of the Irish Parliament and Fine Gael's spokesman on European affairs. Neil is a former county councillor and member of the EU's Committee of the Regions. He also served in the Irish Senate, where he chaired the Senate's Brexit Committee. Sam Murray Hind is an employment partner at Howard Kennedy in London, where she advises on all areas of contentious and non contentious employment law, specialising in court and tribunal proceedings, trade union disputes, and collective bargaining. Hans Helwig is a labour and employment partner at Arnold Siebert Dabelstein in Germany. He specialises in collective and individual labour law, liability of corporate management corporate litigation, compliance and data security. And finally, Emma Richmond is an employment and immigration partner at Whitney Moore in Ireland. She advises on all aspects of the employment relationship and regularly represents her clients on a range of disputes, including unfair dismissal actions, discrimination claims and breach of contract actions. I would like to personally thank them all very much indeed for joining us today and for providing their insights and their expertise on the impact of Brexit and what that could have on employers and their workforce. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Neil to provide some background on the Brexit agreement and his views as to the likely impact on trade. Neil. Quentin, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and it's an absolute pleasure to join you all here, particularly with such a diverse uh, global audience. And for those wondering about the contrary background, I am not at home, but I am in the temporary party room of my own governing party in the temporary parliament uh, here in Ireland. So apologies uh, for the headphones. And for those of you who are convinced that everyone in Ireland is related, I can confirm that my fellow panellist Emma is my sister. But more importantly, uh, on a personal level, I am a client of Whitney Moore, but thankfully not in the employment sector or not for a couple of years until the next election yet. Anyway, but my role, I suppose, is to give a bit of a background about how we've got here. We're well aware that whilst there's quite a few people from Europe on the call, quite a few people from the UK, I, there is a very international audience, not just from the US, but particularly intrigued to see uh, people on from Ecuador and Kenya. And believe it or not, Brexit and this decision will impact everyone. 
it'll impact everyone around the world, but the degrees it'll impact people really depend where you are and indeed what sector you're working in. But I think it's important in that regard for me to give a, a bit of an idea of how we got to the position uh, where we have a deal now, uh, a, de a deal that is in force for the past 21 days. So obviously, as you all are aware, the UK voted to leave the EU following a referendum in June 2016. I'm not going to give you a balanced overview of that. I think Brexit is a terrible idea. I'm a politician. I'm allowed to have those really strong opinions on calls like this. But subsequent to that referendum, what then followed was four years of very detailed negotiation, the results of which is what we're living at the moment. Because the decision of the UK to vote to leave the EU was a decision taken without a specific mandate of what Brexit should look at, which means which meant that that had to be negotiated. And the first area that had to be negotiated was the withdrawal the terms of the divorce and uh, or the separation perhaps so the withdrawal agreement um was negotiated after the then Prime Minister Theresa May triggered what's known as Article 50. Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty gives a member state uh, the ability to notify that they're leaving the EU. It was actually drafted by a British uh, law lord, Lord Kerr, and he said himself it was drafted um, in the background assuming that it would be as a result of a military coup not quite a military coup, but it meant that it was the first time this had ever happened, the first time a member state was leaving the EU. So the withdrawal agreement was negotiated and it had to cover three key areas before the negotiation on the future relationship. And those three areas are really important, particularly when it comes to an employment point of view, when it comes to a talent point of view. So the first area, bit crass, bit simplistic, was that the British government needed to settle its bill. So over the years, it had drawn up essentially a deficit when it came to the EU in terms of payments from European programmes, in terms of property investments, pension pot, all those sort of thing. That required a bit of analysis, a bit of haggling, bring in some big four legal or accountancy firms, and the result was agreed by both. The second area was the rights of citizens, and this is really important when it comes to employment. So ensuring that British citizens living across the EU and European citizens, EU citizens living, remaining within the UK, were still able to maintain their right to work, their right to draw down benefits, the right to attend um, for health appointments, the right to attend educational courses. And again, this was reached with relative ease simply because there's the same amount of British citizens roughly living in the EU as there is EU citizens living in Great Britain. So when you think of the 900,000 or so British pensioners who have re retired to the Costa del Sol and you compare that to the 300,000 or so Polish citizens living in or around Peterborough, the fluctuations that come with that, it was a fairly easy win. Now the third part and it shows the uniqueness of Ireland in this situation and why I've been asked to say a few words in the reference to Whitney Moore was what's known as the Irish Northern Irish Protocol and why that was slightly different is first and foremost um, Ireland and the UK are both part of what's known as the Common Travel Agreement. It goes back to 1922. Ireland is not in Schengen, the UK were never in Schengen. It means that Irish and British citizens are both entitled to have those reciprocal rights in each other's member states regardless of what happens uh, with Brexit. So that was reaffirmed with a memorandum of understanding. But crucially Ireland and the UK are the co-currentors of the Good Friday Agreement, an international peace treaty lodged with the United Nations um, agreed in 1998 that secures the peace in Northern Ireland, a very delicate and indeed fragile peace. And central to that is ensuring there's no barrier, no physical barrier between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And that has resulted in what is known as the, the Irish Northern Irish Protocol, whereby Northern Ireland remains within the rules of the European single market and Northern Ireland applies the EU's customs code to ensure there's no hardening of the border north-south although it does require additional checks and we're starting to see the, the follow out of that and the commercial realities of that between Northern Irish and Great British ports. Um, we're talking Belfast Port, Larne, Kenrain, Stranraer, Belfast Airport to a lesser extent, Warren Point. And eventually that was agreed. It went through a number of British prime ministers, uh, a number of British governments, six or seven indicative votes in parliament, but it allowed then for the UK to actually leave the EU on the 31st of January 2020 and for the negotiations on the future relationship to begin. Those negotiations took place over an 11 month period in 2020 and were very fraught, but what's resulted is the deal that was agreed on Christmas Eve slightly spoiling my own personal Christmas um, 
preparations, but you know, going on CNN on Christmas Eve is certainly a different way uh, to ring in the holidays. So what does this agreement mean and what is its impact? Um, well, firstly, it's a really, really narrow agreement. Um, it's not the very close staying in the single market agreement that certain people would have talked about in the negotiations. It's not the no deal crash out Brexit like is alluded to in the title. We do have a deal and crucially that means that there's no uh, tariffs and quotas when it comes to trade between the UK and the EU but there is restrictions and there is uh, checks when it comes to customs declarations and there is much higher costs and we're starting to see that shift in trading function and it's not an anecdotally it's, it's it's bearing out in statistics whereby for example more Irish people are shopping on amazon.de rather than amazon.co.uk the Irish port of Ross Lair in the very southeast of the country has a 600% growth in traffic because it's now shipping direct to the larger market which is continental Europe um, depending on your preference in Marks and Spencer, certain goods are no longer available. Percy pigs is a bit of a run on them. Um, certain sausages in Northern Ireland. They are being portrayed in some ways as teething problems by the British government and the responsible authorities, and that's understandable, but they are the, indica and the indicative that things are changing and things are changing greatly. Because one area that this deal doesn't cover is that of services and financial services and that has a huge knock-on effect particularly for the role of the city of london and we have seen demonstrable flight of capital assets and talent away from the city of london to other european um cities and european markets so frankfurt paris i think paris has taken over six thousand jobs um, and dublin itself has seen about four thousand people relocate here now these aren't new offices these are expanded offices so barclays bank has gone from having 100 employees in dublin around the corner from where i am to having 350 employees it also has 18 billion euro worth of uh, assets now on its books that would have been moved over from the uk because of the ability to passport into the single market market what if the result for ireland is yes overall it's negative because without the uk in the eu things change but there are opportunities particularly for companies from outside the eu who are looking for that gateway uh, into not just the british market but the european market so ireland remains the only majority english-speaking country in the eu obviously malta has a significant say on that as well but also a common law jurisdiction and also a, a, com a country that is already very familiar to a lot of multinational corporations um, in my own constituency i have microsoft employing over two and a half thousand people of 72 different nationalities in their emia hub um, i'm sitting down in the docks here in the dublin in the in the dublin city center i can see google facebook Twitter, all their head offices, as well as large uh, financial groups like State Street, BlackRock, um, a massive 17-storey shell of a building, which will be the new home for uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in Dublin, HSBC is another one. So I suppose that the real, I suppose, question that this seminar is asking is what is the impact? What can people do who haven't already begin, begun to prepare? Because this deal was agreed on Christmas Eve. It was ratified by the British Parliament on the 30th of December. It hasn't actually been ratified by the European Parliament yet. It's been given um, temp temporary approval by the European Council and it won't be ratified by the European Parliament until April. We have literally just had a motion in the Irish Parliament yesterday on it and um, that was passed. It, it's not a binding motion because this is just a straight trade deal. So it means things have changed and things have changed particularly for firms who are looking about who they can employ because it also changes the ability of British citizens um, to reside in other in, in EU member states going forward. Again, Ireland is immune to this. Ireland is unique. The only thing a British citizen resident in Ireland really needs to do now is they need to make sure they've transferred their driving license from a British one to an Irish one if they're resident. But for e, uh, UK citizens who are resident in the UK, they can no longer spend the more than three months in another EU member state without registering to be domiciled or something in that regard. And we've already seen some high profile cases, uh, Nigel Lawson, um, Boris Johnson's own father, all these sort of people who are looking to change their residency and indeed their citizenship. It presents huge challenges, as I mentioned, huge difficulties, particularly for those of us who are public representatives who look beyond the, the ledger of the economic impact, but it does produce huge opportunities. 
um, for everyone in the world. For Ireland, um, the UK is no longer the export market that it once was. When we joined the EEC together in 1973, about 55% of our exports went to the UK. That's down to 9% at the moment. It's behind um, Germany and Belgium within the EU, and obviously the EU overall is bigger. But it also looks for the, the opportunities that are afforded through EU trade deals. And that goes both ways. So the UK has rolled over about 55 trade agreements with countries like Japan um, and others, Kenya, as, as I see from one of the callers on the line, but also it gives the opportunity for EU member states to maximise recent trade deals, be it with South Korea, Japan, Canada. Um, and we, after the inauguration of Joe Biden yesterday, we look to see what the change in approach uh, from the, U, the new US administration will be. And um, they've already signed, re-signed up to the Paris Climate Accord as of an executive order last night. Will we see a, a UK-US trade deal? There wouldn't been one if the UK hadn't withdrawn certain amendments to the Internal Market Bill. Will we see a resumption of the fabled TTIP talks that were were dropped under under President Trump that had, I suppose, run into difficulty under President Obama, but there was still an aspiration there. Um, and again, the EU has potential now with new trade deals being negotiated with jurisdictions like Malaysia, yeah. uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Australia and New Zealand, um, and that potential there in Southeast Asia, but also looking at the new EU uh, Africa platform and those potentials. So I've touched on Brexit and a liberal bit of the wider world and how it impacts, and the UK's standing in the world or their place in the world not necessarily the standing has changed and that change requires everyone um, to look at their business models to look at their activities and it requires politicians like me to look at the focus of our work as well and a lot of people think brexit is done brexit is over but the agreement reached on christmas eve was merely the end of the beginning um, the fisheries aspect of that agreement have to be re reviewed in five and a half years. Northern Ireland has the ability to vote out of the protocol at the next assembly elections in four years. What is the approach going to be on services going forward? What trade deals are the UK not going to be able to roll over, be it with uh, Canada or South Korea? Or what are the opportunities there? Um, I've spoken widely and probably very, very quickly, so I apologise for that. My accent isn't too strong, but I'm going to hand over now to Sam, um, who's going to go through it in more detail, and I look forward to stay on the line. I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you all so much, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thanks, Neil. Um, I think that was a really great introduction, and um, we're very lucky to have you today here on the webinar. Um, I also would just like to say that I think M&S Percy Pigs were definitely one of the unexpected casualties of Brexit and the Times certainly did focus on that a lot in the UK. Um, I'd like to start this part of the webinar just by asking everyone a question. So if I could ask Crystal to bring up the first poll for us. Um, and the question is, what are your most pressing employment related concerns post Brexit or those of your clients? Is it ensuring protection of personal data? dealing with diverging UK and EU employment laws, managing the restrictions on movement or people, and managing the financial impact of Brexit on business. And that would include implications for redundancies as well. So I'm just gonna give you a few seconds there to register your responses. And Crystal, if I could ask you to put up the results very shortly, we've got them coming through. Okay, so I can see the most popular one there was dealing with diverging UK and EU employment laws, which is actually a great way of segmenting into my talk because that's going to be the first thing that I cover. So in terms of employers' obligations to staff, in the short term, employment law will be unaffected. So all EU-derived legislation and regulations are preserved which means that courts and employment tribunals must continue to apply existing case law and read words into legislation where necessary to bring it in line with EU requirements. However, the EU Withdrawal Act does say that the Court of Appeal and Supreme Court, or higher courts, can depart from EU case law where it appears right to do so. Now, this wording is quite wide, but seems intended to give the UK higher courts some flexibility when faced with surprising ECJ decisions. And there is a very recent ECJ case on collective redundancies um, on when the obligation to consult is triggered. And this is inconsistent with UK law and will cause headaches for employment lawyer, um, sorry, for employment lawyers and employers both. Um, and this is a good example of where the higher courts may politely agree to disagree with the ECJ. 
The European Convention on Human Rights still applies, but the Charter on Fundamental Rights is no longer part of UK law. And that charter has been used in the past to disapply UK legislation. And I'm thinking here of the Ben Carbouche case, um, which relates to the State Immunity Act, which then allowed discrimination claims to be brought in the UK against foreign embassies. Um, as part of the trade deal, both parties agree not to weaken employment rights in force as at the end of 2020 in a manner which affects trade or investment. And those are important words and mean that the UK can make changes. Um, there is an arbitration mechanism led by a panel of experts for cases of alleged breach. It looks like the UK will try to implement some changes, although the timescale for this is unclear. In the last few days alone, there have been reports that the UK would seek to amend the working time regulations, perhaps to move the 48 hour maximum working week, um, and also to allow holiday pay to be based on basic pay rather than including overtime. Now, whilst the government initially denied this, the new business secretary has recently confirmed that the government is considering some changes, but they haven't confirmed what. So we've had murmurings around agency worker regulations and perhaps looking at the cap for compensation in discrimination cases, because at the moment those claims are uncapped. But I don't think business is clamouring for changes, as it fears that the EU will retaliate with fresh barriers to entry if the UK is seen to have any competitive advantage. In practice, it might be difficult for the EU to prove that changes by the UK will indeed affect trade or investment. But looking forward, the UK is free to ignore any new EU directives. Um, there are some in the pipeline which we've already adopted. This includes the whistleblowing directive due to be implemented this coming December. Um, we were already substantially compliant with this in any event, and then there are two further directives in 2020. Now, the UK isn't required to mirror EU developments, but if it diverges in relation to employment rights in a way that materially affects trade or investment, then the UK, sorry, the EU can take appropriate rebalancing measures to include tariffs. And any impact on trade or investment has to be based on evidence, which may be tricky to prove in practice. But we expect that the EU would put, pursue the UK to the fullest extent. The influence of the ECJ is likely to continue. Courts and tribunals are no longer bound to follow new decisions that may have regard to them. And I suspect where ECJ decisions are disregarded, this will simply lead to more legal appeals. And with that in mind, I'd expect a cautious approach from the courts and tribunals. My next topic is data protection. Um, and one of the key risks for business of a no deal scenario was the prospect of the UK being a third country under GDPR which is the General Data Protection Regulation. EU controllers and processors would have needed to put in place adequate mechanisms to protect personal data transfers to the UK. Discussions are still ongoing, but in the meantime, we have a bridging mechanism in place for the next four months, which can be extended by two months. And during this period, personal data can continue to flow from the EU to the UK without needing additional safeguards. Now, when a no deal was looming, many businesses put in place contingency arrangements to safeguard data, um, usually using a contract between the business and the sender on EU approved terms known as standard contractual clauses. And I believe Hans is going to talk a bit more about data protection from an EU perspective and, and what might happen if we don't get an adequacy decision. Um, I would expect, however, for an adequacy decision to be reached during the bridging period. Um, and that would just be a finding that the UK offers an adequate level of data protection. Um, there are some other data protection issues unchanged by the deal. Um, for example, the Information Commissioner's Office will no longer be able to act as lead supervisory authority for cross-border data issues under the GDPR one-stop shop regime. And UK-based controllers, processors without an establishment in the EU um, may have to designate an EU-based representative for GDPR compliance purposes. Moving on to immigration, which was one of the key factors behind the Brexit vote, um, Brexit ends free movement. So where does this leave EU nationals living and working in the UK? Now, for EU nationals who entered the UK prior to the end of December 2020, they will be able to obtain settled status in order to remain in the UK and continue to have the right to work. But they have to apply by the end of June 2021. EU nationals entering from the 1st of January this year onwards will need a visa if they want to work in the UK. Unless they have another avenue for getting a visa, such as ancestry rights, for example, um, they will need to be sponsored by an employer, which means that they need to amass enough points under the revised immigration rules to qualify for a sponsorship visa. Um, this does, however, exclude Irish citizens who have separate arrangements. 
One practical problem for the employers in the UK at the moment concerns the right to work checks. Um, the Home Office guidance states that up until the end of June this year, which is the grace period, there is no change to right to work checks for EEA nationals. Um, so employers should continue to check the passport or national ID card as normal, but not make additional inquiries as to their right to work. So employers could do an online right to work check, but it may not be accurate or up to date. If they go further than that, it could lead to discrimination claims. And the guidance left unanswered what to do where an employer later finds that the EU national has no right to work. Obviously, the employer would need to terminate the employment as a starting point. Um, retrospective checks and inquiries can be made after the end of June, and we'd recommend that they are. Um, the government guidance may protect employers against the risk of enforcement action if they unknowingly hired someone who had entered on or after the 1st of January this year without the right to work. But the employer still has to unwind the employment arrangements and it's not a satisfactory position. Um, we're expecting Home Office guidance shortly on conducting right to work checks from the 1st of July this year um, into the future. And so that brings me nicely on to business travel. And for UK nationals working in the EU, the position will largely be determined by the rules of the individual member states. Um, the trade deal makes some provisions for business travel where the UK national um, is travelling to the EU for less than 90 days in a 180 day period. And that will allow them to attend business meetings without a visa or work permit, but more substantial work will require a visa. In terms of sectorial impact, it's striking that the deal has little to say about services which dominate the UK economy. Um, there's an end to passporting in financial services and the city is counting on a memorandum of understanding in the coming months. Um, in relation to professional services, there's no automatic mutual recognition of professional qualifications. So the UK and EU member state professional regulators can submit joint recommendations to the UK-EU Partnership Council for profession-specific arrangements. And once they're approved, this mutual recognition would provide routes for UK professionals to have their qualifications recognised in other EU jurisdictions and vice versa. And the UK is also permitted to make its own bilateral arrangements with individual member states. I think overall the professional qualification terms are more limited than the UK government had hoped for. And my final point on this rather whistle-stop tour touches on social security and the detached worker rules. Um, where a UK employee is working temporarily in an EU country, um, we'd advise that businesses take advice on the country in which social security contributions should be paid. And under the special rules for detached workers, it might be possible to continue to pay those contributions in the UK only, notwithstanding that the employee is temporarily working in the EU. However, certain conditions must be satisfied and the EU country in question must have decided to, um, to apply these detached worker rules. EU member states have to indicate whether they will apply those rules by the 1st of February this year. I think it's also worth flagging that the new rules will not apply to secondments or assignments which began before the 1st of January, provided that there's no change in the employee's circumstances. And if the receiving country has decided not to apply the rules, then social security will be payable in the country in which the employee is working. Now, the UK and Ireland have made, again, a separate reciprocal social security arrangement which preserves the current position. And having mentioned Ireland once more, I'm delighted to hand over to my Meritas colleague, Emma Richmond. Thank you, Sam. And uh, delighted to speak to everybody today here from um, a virtual Dublin and to welcome you to virtual Dublin. Um, obviously, Neil has set out the background to all of this and from Sam's content so far, you'll all be getting be beginning to get a picture that things are not going to be straightforward and um, there is still a lot to be worked through um, and I think it's only as we go through that some of these issues some issues will arise we can try to anticipate as much as possible but there's a large part of our future we cannot predict and so as an employer for those of you that are on the line that are employers um, and those advising employers we will have to adapt as we go and um, we'll have to see what changes come in um, and how you know be it the UK responds or the EU responds to different actions um, I'm going to try to take a very practical look at this and you'll have seen from the initial poll there some of the concerns that are being raised um, and you'll see the, the second highest uh, concern relates to the free movement of people. Um, obviously free movement 
of workers was one of the core freedoms of the EU. And I think every EU member state has benefited greatly from that free movement. Um, and it has allowed the, the transport of talent around the EU and every country has accepted that. And that has been of great benefit, particularly to Ireland, where we have a small population and, you know, we have at times been able to import great talent and we've exported some great talent as well. But we have certainly benefited here as well. As we've mentioned before, Ireland is somewhat unique. So when people come to me with this concern about the free movement of workers, you need to look at it in the context of Ireland. Um, we have a very unique relationship with the UK. It's a long relationship. It long predates the EU or the formation of the EU. Um, and going forward, it will continue to be a special relationship. So from that point of view, how workers are treated between Ireland and the UK will always diverge slightly from the rest of the EU. Um, you'll have heard mention of the common travel area. Um, that has been in place since 1922. It was reaffirmed by both governments back in 2019. There has been legislation passed to confirm that, and the EU has also recognised that. So in creating the common travel area and maintaining that um, going forward, it is that neither Irish citizens or UK citizens are deemed foreign nationals within each country. So they have the freedom to work, the freedom to avail of education and um, social systems and also certain voting rights. So I think from those that may be on the line that have employees both in the UK and, the, and Ireland, you know, that once the citizens are Irish citizens or UK citizens, that will be largely uninterrupted and they can continue to move their workers over and back. And we have a long history of it. I myself would have a number of clients that have, you know, employees both in Ireland and the UK and both Sam and I would have worked quite closely on with a number of clients and um, because there is that natural overlap. So from that point, I think if you are operating in both jurisdictions, you have some comfort. But I suppose on a practical level, one of the things that I would advise is that if you are considering relocating staff or employees, be it on a temporary basis for secondment or for a longer term, um, one of your housekeeping tasks will be to establish what nationality they are at the outset. Um, so do establish, are they Irish or UK citizens? Um, and if not, you may need to plan for applying for certain immigration permissions um, and make sure that you take that step in moving forward with your plans to move employees. And Sam will have also mentioned just in terms of professional qualifications, you'll need to consider um, are there additional steps you need to take for the recognition of qualifications across borders um, if you are moving employees around the EU. Um, I think that will ultimately hopefully get resolved and um, it hasn't been resolved. There is the mechanism for the mutual recognition that has existed in the past to be continued and hopefully um, that will be addressed. Another aspect that Sam would have touched upon as well is in relation to any divergence in EU employment laws that the UK may take. Um, and I think that may not be as extreme as some at first feared. Um, there obviously has been some media speculation of certain areas that wouldn't be, um, haven't been that well adapted or accepted within the UK. But I think in general, there will be a certain level of harmonization between the EU and the UK. But it is key if when you look at posted workers, and some of you may be very familiar with posted workers, some not so much, but effectively a posted worker is a term derived from the EU, which refers to an employee who relocates on a temporary basis to another EU state. And in that instance, they will under directives that have been introduced, they are deemed to remain an employee in their home country, um, but they will be entitled to certain core rights in the EU country to which they relocate on a temporary basis. And um, those are core, effectively minimum rights. So if they relocate you know, from Ireland to France or from France to Germany, they will be entitled to certain, you know, the legislation that applies to maximum working hours, to minimum break periods, to health and safety entitlements. 
um, and also in terms of gender equality. So when planning about moving workers, obviously in terms of the UK relationship with the EU, again, this is an area that at the moment there isn't much divergence, but going forward, you will need to factor in, have things changed? And um, is it something that you need to address in that context? Also, just looking at the very practical aspect of your contracts of employment, um, as employment lawyers, we would always recommend that you carry out a regular audit of your contracts and ensure that they are up to date, that they take into account um, any changes to legislation. And I think with Brexit, it is a major change that it is worthy to dig out the contracts and bring it to your lawyer and have an audit. And the types of clauses that I have seen so far that I've been focusing on in reviews I've carried out, obviously straight away your jurisdiction clause. So most contracts will provide for what jurisdiction um, the contract will be interpreted under and um, what laws apply. Um, and given that the UK is no longer part of the EU, you may wish to consider, depending on where your parent company is, whether you know you need to change that clause. Do you need to change it to an Irish jurisdiction, or do you need to take a softer approach, but rather maintain maybe the jurisdiction of the UK, but specify some EU legislation that you will refer to in it that you would have previously assumed would have applied under each jurisdiction. The other clause that you will focus on or that you would focus on would be your non-compete clauses, so your post-termination restrictions. And this is one that, again, particularly here in Ireland, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of UK entities may have established bases here in Ireland um, with the prospect of Brexit and likewise Irish entities establishing um, bases in the UK to protect themselves. But with that, um, you run the risk that certain non-compete clauses where, for those of you that are not practicing in it on a day-to-day -day basis, your non-compete clause must address how long it is to last for, um, what geographical area it covers and the business that it covers. And a lot of definitions within the contracts may simply refer to a, a geographical area of the EU and that would have been drafted on the assumption that the UK was part of that EU. So those contracts may no longer be applicable in terms of the UK, and you may need to update those terms. Um, obviously, if you're going about changing contracts of employment, you cannot unilaterally impose that change. You will need to engage with your employee. You will need to get their agreement. Um, you can do it by an addendum, but they will need to be in agreement with that element of it. Um, but I think it is something that I have had raised with me with a number of clients where they feel that perhaps, you know, UK employers may come in and poach staff to help them assist, assist them in establishing um, something in Ireland um, and that the, their current non-compete clause will not cover them to protect against poaching perhaps clients from the UK and that. So that is a very practical approach to some of what you need to look at. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, you know, Ireland's unique relationship is um, will continue and we will always have to diverge slightly in our discussions. Um, whilst we are very much part of the EU, we need to address it separately. So I'm going to pass over to my colleague Hans in Germany, who will speak not only from the German perspective, but also cover the, the wider European perspective. Yes, thank you, Emma. Uh, especially thank you for those uh, insights, which I found quite interesting, even from our mainland perspective. And even though Ireland and Germany, we're still, we're still and will be in the EU. Um, yes. We had we had planned to have a little poll. I think we we are going to skip this uh, with respect to and an eye on on, on the time. Um, so I will try to hurry up a little bit to 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 give us uh, the um, time we foresaw for having a little Q and A later on. Um, I, and I would focus on a little bit of data protection, as Sam has already mentioned, to pick up uh, you know what happens if there won't be any uh, adequacy decision. 
uh, issued by the EU within the specified period, the latest by the end of June, and give you a little insight on uh, what immigration um, rules will apply to UK citizens working in the EU mainland, especially in Germany, and have been working here before uh, 1st of January of this year. So, um, data protection. Data protection um, is always important, as you know, and uh, you shall be aware that it will be very important for the UK and employers who sit in the UK. And um, with employees, they uh, engage on the EU mainland, especially with respect to the uh, territorial scope in Article 3 of the GDPR, which basically says if you pro process data from any citizen on the EU mainland, you have to adhere to the GDPR regardless of where your um, seat of your company is. Um, as I said, Sam, our first speaker, has already touched the evident topics in this regard. Um, but nevertheless, and even if it is most likely that the EU Commission will um, adopt an adequacy decision, we can only advise to watch closely what comes out and what the wording is and whether or not it'll, it'll come at all. Um, because it is unclear if the now agreed respite of another six months gives any hint as to the timeline for the adequacy decision. Um, and more, most, more, moreover, um, the European decision, decision, the European Commission, I'm sorry, um, will now in any case have to consider the implication of, of the Schrems 2 decision, which uh, I'm quite sure you've all heard about, um, and which basically said that an adequacy decision which the European Commission adopted with respect to the US um, was thrown overboard because they said this decision does not adequately secure EU citizens' right, rights with respect to their personal data transferred to US and US employers from, from the EU. So with the Brexit, the UK is formally not considered to be a EU member anymore and will be a third country uh, with respect to um, GDPR rules. And therefore, this adequacy, ad adequacy decision is necessary, as Sam said. Now, applying SHRAMS 2 on the adequacy decision and the content it must have, uh, we cannot be sure um, that the EU Commission will meet the standards uh, the e ECJ uh, has set out uh, to this Zero to, to, with respect to the adequacy, adequacy decision to be met. The UK is not the US, we know, of course. However, uh, also UK authorities uh, grant a much greater access to personal data uh, than, for instance, the German authority do, especially um, with, if you talk about uh, the, the security services and, uh, and so on. Therefore, I'm, I'm not sure we can uh, we can re really rely on this adequacy decision and we may not have a, uh, let's say, Schrems 3 verdict by the, by the uh, ECJ uh, sometime uh, relating to adequacy decision to the UK. So this leaves us with some thoughts about uh, alternatives. Uh, we indulged in after Schrems 2 last summer and we still haven't stopped thinking about, of course. In the absence of this adequacy decision applicable to the UK, um, such transfer will require appropriate safeguards as well as enforceable data subject rights, effective legal remedies for such data subjects in accordance with the Article 46 of the GDPR. And what we most commonly use and know about this are the board binding corporate rules and uh, the so-called uh, standard contractual clauses, which by my personal opinion is served quite well if, if you actually adhere to them. So um, the question is whether we really have to wait for or uh, need an adequacy decision. Um, most likely in binding corporate rules and standard contractual clauses, if they're set up the way the ECJ requests, will even guarantee a, a higher security uh, with respect to um, valid transfer of personal data between UK and EU mainland. Um, so SHRAMS 2, again, where personal data are transferred to the UK on the basis of Article 46 safeguards and supplementary measures might be necessary to bring the level of protection of data transferred up to the EU standard of essential equivalence. 
Um, and lastly, what we could also use, but is not really recommended, is Article 49, the so-called specific um, uh, the derog derogation listed in Article 49, I'm sorry, um, but it has an exceptional nature and is discussed only as a, if you want backup, if everything else fails, you could uh, seek to rely on uh, Article 49. Um, so, what to sum it up, basically, we say um, binding corporate rules, standard contractual clauses should could be used, in my view, should be seriously considered um, if it regards uh, with regard to transfer of your personal data of European employees to the UK. Another decision or another outcome of the agreement between the UK and uh, the EU is, um, as I mentioned it also, is that the one-stop shop principle, which is very convenient for like pan-European employers, um, has been taken away from, um, from those countries. We cannot use this anymore. And here I just wanted to mention um, one thing because the European Data Protection Board emphasizes uh, that the decision to benefit from the unified lead supervisor or supervisory authority enabled by the one-stop shop mechanism in cross-border processing cases is still up to the individual controllers and processors who to that end may decide whether to set up a new main establishment in the EU under the terms of Article 4 um, falling, falling to the end of the transition period. So you may consider, you know, using the same mechanism with a new main establishment in any EU country and you can then still re rely to the um, on, on the one-stop shop mechanism for your um, for your EU mainland establishments of course for the UK it is not needed since it doesn't fall under the GDPR anymore and the same you could maybe use or the same result you may you may have if you um, as I mentioned the uh, representative um, in the EU in accordance with uh, Article 27 of the GDPR. This is uh, something you could also use as kind of like a one-stop shop person if you want, um, if you just you know designate this representative for the data uh, transferred uh, to the EU and back from the UK. Um, it's also a possibility to kind of like benefit from this very easy uh, one-stop shop mechanism and not having to uh, go back and forth to each country, to each establishment in each country and the UK and and kind of never know what rules apply and, and who will be uh, the person in charge um, and the authority to adhere to it, to go to, which is the most important thing, you know, in, in case uh, of a breach of data. So without giving you time to digest this, I will jump into the last part of my um, speech, which relates to immigration. That is actually quite straightforward. And I think it's something, uh, it's probably the easiest thing um, to apply uh, out of the agreement. Uh, what happens to UK citizens who have been working in the U UK, EU uh, or in Germany uh, before uh, 1st of January of this year? The good, no, uh, good news is that their rights are frozen. So you basically, if you if you have worked here um, using and benefiting from the free movement um, scheme set out in the EU, the only thing you have to do until uh, the end of June 2021, you have to go to your local immigration authority in the city you live in, in Germany, and uh, apply for a residence title which will issue it automatically as long as you can prove that you have been working and living in um, in Germany before uh, the end of last year. So this is very easy then they will not ask any questions and uh, you just basically get um, the status you had before. However, it is, it is important to um, uh, to obtain this title and to go to the authorities because otherwise you will lose your rights. So if you, for whatever reason, would miss um, this term and, and do not apply for this residency title before the end of June of this year, then uh, you would be considered a third party, a third country citizen and would have to uh, apply again like any 
person outside of the EU and um, or the EEA. Um, permanent, the, the other uh, easy thing is permanent residency. If you have lived five years um, in Germany under the EU freedom of movement scheme, um, then you you will just, you know, must not even have worked here, but just like ha had a residency and lived in, in Germany for five years, you can, um, it's the same thing. You just apply uh, for this residency title uh, until the end of June. Um, and if you are an employer who has uh, staff in Germany, um, you don't have to do anything and don't worry about anything. If, if your people have been working here before uh, the end of last year, then um, it's basically uh, all set as mentioned before and uh, in case you only estab establish this uh, or create a new establishment so uh, in, the, in this year um, and the person does not fall under the old freedom of movement regulation the, meaning the employee uh, then you must uh, the, then this uh, third uh, this employee must apply uh, for proper third country title of residence and also work permit so same basically as with individuals, UK individuals, work, individual, individuals working for uh, German employers, the same for a UK employer. If, every, if you had people here before the end of the year, um, nothing changes if you send people to Germany only this start this year, then they will have to be, they have to apply for titles of residence and work permits. Um, posted workers must leave by 31st of March. I think Neil had mentioned that briefly in his um, introductory speech. So this was a run through through my notes and um, my topics. And I am happy to hand over to Quentin, I think, who will lead the Q&A session um, in case we leave you with any questions. That is great. Thank you very much indeed, um, everyone, for their thoughts and comments. We do have uh, we do have a couple of questions. We've got a little bit of time, uh, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, first one, uh, I guess this is to Sam about the UK. Um, um, our UK-based company has offices in Switzerland, and we are a service provider in the oil and gas industry, working in industrial plants. A very spe specialist manual role. Pre-Brexit, we had a freedom of movement to allow employees from Switzerland to work in the UK for short-term projects for under four weeks. What is the best solution now to allow them to work on UK soil for these short-term assignments if we have UK service engineers that are working on other projects? I think that's actually one that's straying over into my immigration team's uh, sphere and I think the rules with Switzerland are slightly different so I'm afraid I might have to abstain for that one but we'll definitely follow up with you after this um, webinar and get back to you with um, some comments. Okay, uh, thanks Sam. Um, and now one actually for our Irish colleagues. Um, if we are planning to send a UK citizen to work in Ireland, can their family travel with them? Emma? Yeah, um, obviously UK citizens, yes, there's no problem coming to Ireland. Where the challenge comes in and where I've dealt with it is that if their family are non-EEA nationals, um, in that instance, then they will require permission. They will need to apply for um, additional permission, immigration permission, and indeed the British citizen that they're traveling with can sponsor them and there is a financial requirement there as well so they will need to meet that financial threshold. Okay uh, thank you um, and Sam this is, I think this is one for you as well. Um, uh, how can a business try to avoid discrimination claims in its recruitment procedures when dealing with applicants who don't have a right to work in the UK? Um, I think sort of giving um, a sort of general position on this and the starting point is that you have to treat all applicants the same. So you will carry out appropriate checks on all prospective employees, not just those that you think are of non-British descent or who might be of non-British descent. 
Um, and a wider point is that you can't prevent someone from submitting an application on the basis that they don't have the right to work. So employers really need to be reviewing their application forms and making sure that there isn't a question on that form um, and not declining applications on that basis either, because the rejection of an application or of an offer to work can lead to those discrimination claims. Um, and tribunals are often very unsympathetic about employers who are trying to balance those discrimination claims against the practical problems of hiring someone without the right to work. Um, and we'd normally be seeing a claim for indirect discrimination because of race. Um, and in the past, there is um, objective justification for such claims that the employer can run. So it can try and show that its actions were a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. But that legitimate aim has to correspond to a real business need um, to overcome that discriminatory impact. And um, having this discussion with my immigration colleagues, I think we both agree that it's much more difficult to objectively um, justify these decisions now because the new rules give employers much more leeway than the old resident labour market test. So we would always advise taking legal advice in those circumstances so that you don't leave yourself at risk. Okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Um, and now just an interest of balance, an EU question. Um, could you briefly highlight <clears throat> the effects of Brexit on social security of EU employees working in the UK and moreover on posted workers? Yes, Hans, it's yours, one of you. We have lost your sound. Hans, we can't hear you, I think. Yep, go ahead. Do you hear me now? Yes, yeah, better. Thank you. I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, Yes, before uh, before Brexit and, and still uh, in before Brexit, it was basically the same. What is it? One unified uh, unified social security system in in the, EU, in the EU and and England, and regardless of your place of residence, um, uh, you, you all the same rules applied, and regardless of where you paid your social security contributions, um, this now of course evidently changed, um, meaning that. You cannot apply for um, unemployment benefit in the UK anymore if, if you've worked uh, all your life long in, in, in Germany, for instance, or anywhere in the EU. Um, it was different before. Um, with respect to um, health insurance, for instance, we have we have an interesting uh, idea or an interesting uh, situation, I think, because Germany and the UK set up a, a social security a treaty in the April of 1960, uh, which is quite some time ago. So um, we probably have to look into that again now to find out about um, health insurance, for instance, uh, with regard to workers going back and forth from uh, EU and um, between EU and, and the UK, for instance. That is one out of many topics which you could touch um, with, with regard to this question. Okay, uh, that is great. Thank you very much indeed. I'm not seeing any other questions and we are at the top of the hour. Um, so I would just like to, on behalf of Meritas, um, thank very much Neil, Sam, Emma and Hans for their time and their insights uh, this afternoon. I'd also like to thank all our audience uh, for joining us. Um, if you would like to uh, discuss your legal employment issues with any of the um, panellists, then please do reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be very happy to be in touch. Um, but for me, um, have a very good day. Uh, keep safe, keep well, and we look forward to seeing you on another occasion. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.